let's get started, everyone. And as more people join, we will welcome them to our event tonight. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second talk in our Laurier Ed Talk series. My name is Mariah Baldessero, and I am the School Relationships and Outreach Coordinator with Waterloo Public Library. Throughout tonight's event, please utilize our Q&A feature to ask any questions you might have. And we will invite you at times to use our chat function to chat amongst yourselves and for us to get some participation from you. With that, I'm going to pass the floor over to Dr. Maria Cantalini-Williams to start, our out, start us off tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to uh, be the Dean of the Faculty of Education of Wilfrid Laurier University. And I'm very proud of the many programs that we offer that are related to education. So in addition to our flagship program of the Bachelor of Education, we also offer a Master of Education, a Minor in Education, and an undergraduate program called International Education Studies. You can find more information about these programs on our website. I'd like to thank the Waterloo Public Library for organizing these sessions for us and for co-hosting. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Avis B teaches a range of courses in our Faculty of Education, including courses in the International Studies Program, the Bachelor of Education, and the Education Minor. Her areas of expertise include international teacher training, refugee education, and science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in very many diverse contexts, which you'll hear more about. She's also written about the development of international mindedness in the International Baccalaureate Program of high school students. And she's also written about cross-cultural research collaborations. Before coming to Laurier, she was an educator in Europe, Asia, Africa, and none of it. She is definitely uh, one who walks the talk and uh, will share her expertise with us. I can attest that in addition to her expertise in the area of international education, Avis is an avid science educator. Uh, she loves everything related to space and the moon, and she lives out the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So now I pass over the uh, talking stick to Ava Speak, Dr. Ava Speak from our Faculty of Education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for that great introduction. You made me blush. Um, also, thank you to the Waterloo Public Library for having me this evening. And of course, for all of you who are joining us by Zoom, I really appreciate your presence today. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'll just go ahead and read what I have on the slide. You can read along with your, on your own. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the Wilfrid Laurier University's Waterloo campus and Waterloo's public libraries are on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We're on the Haldeman Tract of 1784, promised protected land for the Haudenosaunee people to maintain a traditional way of life. Of the 950,000 acres given to the Haudenosaunee, less than 5% remains Six Nations land today. Prior to these agreements, this territory was respected under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty amongst the Haudenosaunee, Mississauga, and Anishinaabe nations. Globally, there are over 370 million Indigenous people, many of whom have had their ancestral lands stolen from them. By acknowledging the land and agreements that have not been upheld around the world, we take an important step to stop the perpetuation of the damages caused by colonization so we can begin to work to reverse them. So um, I'd like to start with just a little bit of an idea where we're heading this evening. The um, plan is that I'll talk about three different ideas. I'm going to start by doing my very best to define a very ill-defined term, and that's international education. I'll talk about what COVID has revealed or illuminated in international education. And I'll finish by proposing how a shift towards interculturalism 
can be constructive in improving education on a global scale. You, if you're part of the Laurier community, you probably knew that last week was International Education Week, and it's actually part of International Education Month. So I think the timing for this presentation is pretty much spot on. So before I go any further, let's do the, the teacher task of assessing prior knowledge. So what would be great is if in the chat, you could take a minute just to write three words that come to mind or that describe international education. And this will help me see what you already know or what your perceptions are about the idea of international education. So if you just take a minute to do that, that would be great. And if you only have one word, that's fine as well. Okay, super, I see some words coming up. Diverse, multilingual, vast, this is true. I also think what's being made clear to me, it's not an easy term to define. I'll wait a few more seconds if anyone else would like to share. I see the word mobility, that's true, very interesting. Okay, great, I'll stop there. Thank you for those. Oh, one more popped up global perspectives, diverse, lovely, movement of people and dynamic. These are wonderful terms. Thank you, everyone. Oh, now we're having a flood. Diversity, cultural awareness, global mindedness. I think this is a well-informed group. I can tell already by the kinds of words that you've chosen. So thank you for those. Um, what I'd like to do now is, I'll just close my chat. Um, I would like to ill-define international education. And to all the grammarians who are with us this evening, I apologize. I know that ill-defined is typically an adjective. I'll be using it as a verb. Um, international education really is ill-defined. It's um, a term that really lacks a clear definition or description, and it doesn't have clear limits around what it is and what it is not. And there's lots of terms I've come across in the literature, either through my own reading and also my own writing and research as well, where we describe international education as blurry or ambiguous, indistinct, fuzzy, woolly, not definite or vague. And unfortunately, it's such a broad, vast term, it really does get described in these ways quite often. What I'm going to propose is that defining international education really depends on your lens. And I'll look at five lenses with you this evening. We'll look at the lens of K-12 education, and we'll look at the lens of post-secondary institutions. And I'll use Laurier and some of the great international education initiatives happening there. I'll use that as an example. Um, the lens of government, again, is going to be quite different as is the lens of the private sector. Finally, we'll look at the lens of the NGOs or the NPs. These are the non-government and non-profit organizations. And again, there's going to be similarities throughout, but depending on the lens that we regard international education, we're going to have very different descriptions and outcomes. So I'm going to start with um, K-12 international education, and let's use Ontario as our example. Um, Ontario has, and I think it was published in 2015, an international education strategy, and it's got five components that I'll just touch on very lightly. Um, the first one is this idea of global awareness. And in the strategy, this is really manifested through things like language learning, um, the secondary or high school humanities courses that focus on different geopolitical issues. Um, there's also opportunities in non-pandemic times for studying abroad and different experiences of learning or experiential learning. 
Um, the second component is the internationalization of the curriculum. And this is really integration of global perspectives into teaching and learning. Thirdly, there's a desire to share expertise, the Ontario expertise in education at home and abroad. And this happens through exchanges and visiting teachers. Again, this idea of experiential learning for teachers to leave Canada and also to visit Canada. Um, you may not be aware that Ontario actually has around 20 schools that deliver the Ontario curriculum outside of the country. Most of these are in China, there's a smaller number in the Caribbean and in Europe as well. And again, that's part of the international strategy to have that curriculum being taught abroad. Finally, um, the international students are coming to Ontario and they are in the K-12 sector as well. And they really make a significant contribution to education in Ontario schools, not only in terms of diversity, but also in terms of contributing to our economy. Um, Pre-pandemic, and again, these numbers are a little bit harder to verify now that the restrictions have happened on travel, but pre-pandemic, we had about 18,000 K-12 international students going to school in Ontario. And that represents just about half of all the international students in all of Canada. The majority do come from China and the school districts and the private schools that host these students are supported by the Association of School Districts. And the Association of School Districts, I think has something in the order of 50 school districts and 300 plus private institutions, including our two districts here in Waterloo. Um, I think that this, again, like I said, contributes a lot to the diversity of our schools, but also the economy, because they do bring in things through their tuition, accommodation, retail, tourism, and so on. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about my background in schools, in K-12 schools, and that's the um, overseas international schools. And these K-12 schools are English curriculum schools, but they're outside English-speaking countries. We're looking at somewhere in the order of 6 million students globally who attend these schools, and about 500,000 staff. My personal estimate is we probably have in tens of thousands of Canadians who teach in these schools. There really is a wide range of clientele, staffing, curricula, operational models. One important contribution is the International Baccalaureate. If you're familiar with the IB, this was born in international schools in Geneva, the International School of Geneva. And it's an important contribution to the notion of international mindedness, which I think relates a lot to international education. So let's move on to post-secondary international education. And we'll use this, um, our university, Laurier is a great example. Uh, Jane Knight, who is at OISE, has defined internationalization. And this term is used probably by every post-secondary institution in Canada. The idea that we're going to integrate international, intercultural, global dimensions into the purpose, functions, delivery, and post-secondary of all post-secondary education. And that, like I said, was Jane Knight who coined this term, but you'll see this on every website virtually for post-secondary institutions in Canada. So how do we go about this? How does Laurier go about this? Well, we really encourage incoming students from abroad. And again, this is to enrich both the diversity of the international and domestic student experience, but importantly, this also contributes to the economy as they pay close to triple, in some cases, the tuition fees of a Canadian citizen, of a domestic student. Um, you can see here there's two brochures that are published and available on the website at Laurier, one in Spanish, one in Mandarin. Um, right now, and again, numbers are a little bit distorted, about 7 to 8% of Laurier's 21,000 students are international. Um, another thing that's really important is we encourage domestic students to travel abroad. And again, pre-pandemic, students would be working through exchanges, study trips, uh, taking courses at other institutions, working on research projects, work placements, volunteering, and so on. Another really important aspect is 
the integration of lifelong learning, intercultural skills, and um, understanding global diversity. And a lot of this is really um, happening through the Office of Global Engagement. They coordinate student um, experiences abroad. They really encourage the International at Home projects, which includes the intercultural certificate, a way for students to build those intercultural skills. And they just provide so many fabulous programs, services and experiences to promote internationalization. So at Laurier, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the program that I work really closely with that Maria had mentioned, the International Education Studies um, Bachelor of Arts. And it's a joint program that came to be in 2019. My colleagues, Steve Sider in the Faculty Edu of Education, our former Dean, Colleen Muller Holt from the Faculty of Education, Alex Latta in the Global Studies Department, and many, many other people pulled together their skills and resources and experiences to create this really unique program, the only one in Canada. I came on board in July of 2020. And really, our program has four important pillars. This idea of flexibility, being able to think flexibly across education systems around the world, to gain knowledge of global context, and that's really what they're doing in the global studies courses that they take. And then also we encourage them to gain experience in culturally, linguistically diverse contexts. All of those pillars really are what ground the intercultural understanding aspects of the program. And that really is the central feature of what we do. And I'm gonna circle back to this because I think this is a great model of how intercultural understanding can be developed. So I'm going to now move on to the lens of the federal government. And the federal government has an international education strategy and a lot of this has to do with really promoting um, student study, bringing students in and also sending students abroad. So to promote study and work abroad by the Canadian students, there really is an encouragement to reach out and work and study in maybe those hot global markets, particularly in Asia. Canadian students, though, do tend to remain in Canada for their undergraduate study, as you can see in this graph. We send about 11% of our students overseas. This is on a national level, whereas other countries such as France, Germany, and, and Australia send significantly more. And this is an area the government's targeted to grow on. Now, a second aspect of this federal government strategy is to increase the diversity of international students to reach additional global markets. Currently, the majority of the students are coming from India and China, which is not that surprising, considering they have such large populations. But there's this desire to really reach out and access other markets and build those connections, not only in Asia, but also in Europe, Africa, South America. Um, a, th sec a third aspect of this global education strategy or international education strategy is to really increase the support for Canadian education sector institutions so they can help grow and export their services and really explore new opportunities abroad. If you take a look at this graph, you can see Canada has done quite well in terms of the number of international students in Canada. We're around 500,000 students. This is data from 2018. So again, it's probably a little bit different right now as we're in the pandemic, but that's tremendous considering that we're only behind what's happening in the United States and the UK, which I think have much larger post-secondary educational systems. Another point to this is to recognize the growth, to really support that growth of bringing in the international education students. So there's some sustainable um, numbers for years to come. And you can see on this graph, particularly in the college system, we're seeing quite a nice steep line on that graph, but also in universities. There's also growth in um, ESL or language training, French and English language training and in um, the college sector. Yes, I mentioned it, K-12, to sorry, that's the last one, the K-12 to sector. All right, so we'll move along now to the fourth lens, and that would be the private sector. And this is big business. International education brings 
20 plus billion dollars, 170,000 plus jobs to the Canadian economy each year. Yes, this is partly due to the elevated tuitions and all those associated support services, but there's also things like accommodation, retail, transport, tourism that do add to our economy. There are other examples of education commerce that have a role domestically, but also really tap into international markets. And that includes the private schools, tutoring businesses, language learning, publications, and educational software. Um, we'll finish off with the fifth lens, and that lens is from the NGOs, the non-government organizations, and the nonprofits. Charities, aid agencies, um, faith-based organizations, the UN agencies, including UNESCO, UNICEF, the World Bank, um, grassroots movements, they're all going to view education very differently. And for the most part, their intention is to create equitable access to education. Um, there's a lot of talk in the news about refugee education. Um, this has been really significant, particularly with events in Afghanistan. There's environmental and climate literacy, which is really a global issue and has gained attention. Ensuring accessible education for girls, but also for women. With the um, social political movements, including anti-racist education. And also very timely is adult learning and education. For example, um, ensuring correct current knowledge relating to COVID-19 and vaccinations and transmission is very important. So there's a lot of issues that are being raised in the NGO community that I think um, maybe draw us now to make some conclusions. And also, um, I think particularly with COVID, some important things have been illuminated. So I'm going to pull together now a few statistics from a range of sources, but they're primarily UN sources, the World Bank, UNICEF, UNESCO. Um, keep in mind, most of these are pre-pandemic, but I think unfortunately with that, the numbers may be a, a little bit more grim following uh, you know, the events of the last 18 months. So I'll start off by just noting that there are about a billion school age children and we consider school age children about age six to 17. And there are about a quarter of them, 250 million who currently don't attend school at all. Um, particularly for girls who are living in areas of violence, instability, uh, areas of conflict. And again, Afghanistan rings, rings true right now they're 2.5 times more likely to be out of school. We know that when we educate girls, things like uh, child marriage, maternal mortality rate, child deaths, public health crises, they really are all greatly reduced. I think the big picture message here is that for school-aged children, global inequity is very much the norm in terms of accessing education. All right, so the next stat will relate to the quality. Um, right now, we are looking at about 60% of students globally not reaching the minimum expectations or proficiency levels, particularly with literacy and numeracy. Globally, we need somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 million new teachers to hit that target set by the UN to have universal education by 2030, and we really are not on track to achieve this. This is a big reason why these students are not targeting, meeting those targets. Um, the training of teachers is also a big issue. Um, Low-income countries, really about 25% are untrained in the primary years, and then the secondary school teachers, about 42% are untrained. In places like Sub-Saharan Africa, up to 90% of teachers lack the training. What really has become clear is during the pandemic, we saw the privileging of really specific solutions to um, cope with the pandemic and the lockdown, such as online learning, but that just led to some increased marginalization in countries with very limited resources. In summary, the quality is very wide ranging on a global scale and the pandemic has really only um, magnified that. Okay, and finally, um, I'd like to focus a little bit on the post-secondary sector. 
really, we have about 40% of the global population pursuing some form of post-secondary education. Um, but that's really quite distorted. About 35% of the low and middle income countries pursue, students are pursuing this. Whereas in the high income countries, including Canada, we have one of the highest graduation rates, if not the highest in the world, the higher income countries are around 79%. Keep in mind that most people on the planet have not been on an airplane, something like 5% have not flown outside of their country, uh, have flown outside of their country. Uh, an average global household income is close to $10,000, something in the order of 40% don't have internet access. Really, the summary message of this is that post-secondary education in general really is inaccessible to the majority. Now, with those three issues I've raised that, again, have been really become much more obvious and apparent during the pandemic, we're looking at inequity, ranging quality, and inaccessibility. And what these really point to is what's called the educational divide, and that's been illuminated by the pandemic, like I said. If you're part of the Laurier community, there is a wonderful course that I've taught that was designed by my colleague, Steve Sider, that really zooms in on this issue of the educational divide and the inequity. It's highly recommended. All right, so we've kind of established the different lenses that we can look at international education, but I think we've maybe come down to the real issue of international education and these points I've made in terms of the educational divide. What I'd like to point out is that international education, in light of these inequities and ranging quality and accessibility, I think we need a new, um, more urgent definition, something that really is very purposeful and focuses on the need for increased equity. This is meant to level resources, both human and economic, and really ensure access for everyone. So when we get rid of the fuzziness and we move into a definition that's a little more concrete, I'm gonna propose that international education is the equitable distribution of global resources to provide access to high quality K to 20 education for all. And when I say K to 20, I'm including post-secondary. Now um, with that, we need a foundation and that foundation to really um, collaborate and cooperate and share our resources to reaching this goal of education for all, that foundation really needs to be grounded in intercultural understanding. And intercultural understanding is something that I think is a little bit misunderstood at times. In my experience in international schools, it's often attributed to things like flags. I'm in the Czech Republic right now, and this is the Czech flag, and it's also associated with food and famous people. This is Martina Navratilova, who is Czech. Um, also, after we talk about flags, foods, and famous people, we also mention fashion and festivals. And these are very superficial levels of culture and very superficial levels of understanding other cultures. We're really about moving beyond these super, superficial aspects. What intercultural understanding is, and I'm going to borrow um, a definition from Deardorff, who is one of the top scholars in the world of international um, understanding and this idea of understanding across cultures. And she describes intercultural understanding as the ability to take on different perspectives in order to think, act, and communicate effectively and respectfully across cultures. And in many ways, this is the central purpose of education in my mind. With these considerations I've raised about the inequity, I think we really have a better chance of cooperating to improve education if we really apply this notion of understanding across cultures. So I'm just going to borrow from the program that I work in, this International Education Studies program, the three main components that we focus on. We have courses from our Global Studies department, which look at the geopolitical aspects and really understanding the contexts of um, global issues. We have our international education courses where we're looking at understanding education from many different perspectives and being able to see things in different ways. 
And then we send our students on local and international placements in diverse contexts where they may be working in different cultures and different languages. Now, these three parts of our program actually mirror what I think are the three pillars of intercultural understanding, and that really is at the center of our program. This idea of the knowledge of global contexts, the ability to take on new perspectives, and the experience in culturally diverse contexts. And they really match what we do in our program, and I think they are really quite foundational if we're going to work towards um, collaboration to improve international education. So with those pillars, I think what we would want to do is maybe start to think about um, unpeeling and peeling back layers. And I apologize, I've used a lot of metaphors this evening, but I think sometimes the metaphors are the most effective way to communicate these fuzzy concepts. So when we peel back the layers of privilege, when we peel back, back the layers of um, economics and even elitism and all those statistics I shared that really represent a small fraction of the world that enjoys a lot of the um, benefits of international education. If we peel those back and we get down to the center, those global inequities are revealed. And what I'm proposing is this new definition of international education combined with this awareness of intercultural understanding, that those two, when merged together, can really help us explore our future in international education. So what I'm gonna propose again, or maybe repropose, is this idea that international education is about the equitable distribution of global resources to provide access to high quality K-20 education for all. And it really is grounded in intercultural understanding, the ability to take on different perspectives in order to think, act, and communicate effectively and respectfully across cultures. So I think I'll end here after giving you a whistle-stop tour of the many faces of international education and maybe some things to consider about how we can move towards reducing those inequities through intercultural understanding. So um, I'll stop here and I'm really am open to taking questions if anyone would like to do so. I think I'll get some help with the questions if that's all right. Absolutely, so feel free to use the Q&A feature if you have any questions or if you prefer to use the chat function, I can also take a look there. Okay, nothing yet. I must have just nailed it. <laughs> you had all the answers. All right. If there are no questions, then, um, Dr. Avis, is there anything you would like to share with us before we finish up for the evening? Um, I think that the pandemic has actually given us a really, you know, there's been a lot of challenges and a really, a really difficult time personally, professionally for all of us. But I do think it's a, it's a silver lining, if not a very thin, thin silver lining that it has, I think, opened our eyes to some serious issues that need attention. I know we've put a lot of time recently into exploring climate issues issues of anti-racism and social justice, but I also think education has actually become in the forefront as well. I see some questions. Yes, we do. So our first question is, you've mentioned your students get to work abroad. Could you give examples? Uh, yes, someone just asked if I could put the slide with the, yes, okay, the intercultural definitions back up. Um, okay, so uh, examples, of working abroad. Um, I can talk about what we're doing in my program at in international education studies at Laurier. There are um, placements that are required in the program. We're working very hard to secure safe placements. It is a little bit of a different world right now. 
Um, there is a little bit of unsureness whether they'll be able to travel. Our first group will be going out in May. The challenge with COVID is that we've had to be flexible and be able to pivot towards placements that maybe are online, that are local. And the thing about Canada, and I think even the sort of Kitchener, Waterloo, Toronto corridor is it's a very diverse set of communities. So we actually have a lot of really incredible opportunities for students to get experience, the cross-cultural experience in our own community. So even though the pandemic's limited how we can send students away, we do have some really interesting things that we can do locally or online as well with some outside agencies. All right, so we have another question. How do you propose we address international education at the elementary level when many think that the idea of the X you mentioned covers their curriculum in terms of cultural diversity and multiculturalism? Hmm, that's a great question. I know that the, the biggest, um, from my own research, the biggest factor that seems to really shape intercultural values and ideas is direct experience, that authentic direct experience. And I know with in some communities, it's hard to find um, authentic ways for learners to be exposed to people who are different from themselves. But I think with a little bit of creativity and a little bit of um, research, teachers can do that. I know, Judy, you asked this question, but things like changemakers.org, the um, organization that Brianna Heals, an Ontario teacher who was nominated for the Global Teacher Prize, um, there are great resources online that people can tap into that will still allow them to honor the curriculum expectations, but really maybe from the computer side, explore different cultures. There are, I think, in most schools in Ontario, language learning opportunities, particularly in French, but I think language is also a tremendous way to expose kids to other ways of thinking. And even things like Duolingo, which is such a simple but very effective way to just explore language. I think there are a lot of digital tools that can be tapped into. All right. Oh, one more. Look at that. You've sparked some interest now. <laughs> How do you believe international education can help address the rise in dic dictatorship, authoritarianism across the globe? How can IE be used to stay ahead of the trend? Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. I know in, in my world in international education, we talk a lot about the International Baccalaureate. And I think in Ontario, the IB, International Baccalaureate, it's a K-12 to curriculum that's designed for all schools, but it's quite, um, it's quite heavily used in the international schools. But part of their mission, and I always try to remember this, is to understand that um, without necessarily agreeing with someone, without necessarily feeling that there has to be uh, right and wrong, that you can still take on their perspective. And I've always carried that with me. The idea of helping learners from a young age, I understand that there are different perspectives understand that there's different ways of being. And like I said, the best way to do this is to expose, to expose kids particularly to diversity. My hope is that when we do this as a society with children, this is going to eventually work their way through. And it's, I think it's a big ask to make it all the way to the top levels in one generation, but there are some examples of countries that have overcome tremendous hardship and been able over generations to be able to really come to a point where the atrocities of the past have been overcome. I lived in Japan for a number of years, and if you have any knowledge of World War II history, obviously Japan is a very difficult past and has worked very hard to reconcile that and has now become in a lot of ways, they're very passionate about, um, you know, anti-nuclear, not only testing, but all forms of nuclear um, uh, scientific work and so on. And they've really shown that over generations it can happen. I think that has a lot to do with the school system. So that's my hope is that when we start young, we expose to diversity and we really stay on a steady course towards this. I'm hoping that like you asked, that we can 
have an impact on terrible things such as dictatorships and you know various um, societies that are experiencing violence and unrest. Wonderful. Okay, let's see. You got a big thank you for that one. You're welcome, Clarissa. Thank you. Excellent. I think that is all the questions we have from our audience tonight. So with that being said, thank you very much, Dr. Ava Seek, for being here with us today. I thank think you. this was great information for all of us and there is so much to look forward to in education and there's so much more to come. So this is just a wonderful demonstration of that. I just wanna let everyone know that our next Laurier Ed Talk will take place on Wednesday, January 26th at 7 p.m. and we will have Dr. Maria Cantalini-Williams to share with us the reimagining of a faculty of education, innovative programs, and pedagogies. And you can register via our website. And thank you all for joining us. And again, thank you, Dr. Avis, for being here tonight. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Mariah. It was a great experience. I hope everyone has a pleasant evening. Thank you, everyone.